Uh, my name's uh, Alistair Jones and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at the University of Waikato. It's my uh, real pleasure to welcome you here to the third uh, lecture in this year's Winter Lecture Series. I'd like to pass on the apologies of our Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Roy Crawford, who is unable to be here tonight. Um, before we start, um, I've just got to quickly run through the usual housekeeping things that the restrooms are located in the foyer opposite the Opus Bar. In case of an emergency, uh, please exit through the doors through which you came. Um, obviously don't take any notice of the exits left and right. Um, ushers and event staff will be able to assist you safely and the assembly area is between the academy and the shops. Please check your mobile phones are switched off um, and are turned to silent. Um, as most of you are aware, the University of Waikato celebrates 50 years of teaching and research excellence this year. So this year's winter lecture series is a special one, and each lecture uh, having a forward-looking focused theme as we look towards our future and start thinking about what the university might look like in the next 50 years and beyond. The winter lecture series is where we take an opportunity to showcase the community showcase to the community the wealth of knowledge and expertise we, that's on hand here at the university. And among our academics, the various research projects and also our alumni and guest speakers. The last couple of weeks, lectures are focused on the future of business and cyber security, and Judith Collins is probably wishing that Cameron Slater had far better security. Tonight's lecture, uh, we'll talk a look at the future of entertainment, and Jesse, I'm pretty sure you're pretty secure, are you? <laughs> I'm now delighted to introduce a very familiar face in entertainment in New Zealand, University of Waikato alumnus and TV presenter Jesse Mulligan, the host of tonight's lecture. Uh, please welcome Jesse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. The house lights seem very high. Have we, have we got the audience illuminated for a reason, or is that just so I can see them better? They look very uh, attractive. I don't mean to complain. Uh, hello, how are you? Are you all feeling good? Thank you for coming out on a winter's night. It's nice to see you. I, I'm delighted to be your host uh, for the evening. Uh, I've got to say a few weeks ago, oh, many weeks ago actually, uh, Nicola from the University of Waikato uh, called me up and she said to me, uh, Jesse, we're having this uh, winter lecture series. This one's on the future of viewing. Would you like to come down and host? It's on the uh, 20th of August. It's going to go till about 7 p.m. And I said, look, I'd love to do it. I said, I'll just go and check my calendar. And she said, don't play hard to get. <laughs> she said, everybody in New Zealand knows you've got no place to be 7 p.m. weeknights anymore. <laughs> I'll see you on the 20th. And so, and so here I am, and I'm delighted to be here. I'll probably be back here tomorrow night. <laughs> um, I am very attached to the University of Waikato, very attached. My stand-up comedy career started about 100 metres that way in the old uh, WSU hall. Uh, I was a law student at the time and, um, and I saw a little sign up uh, that said first timers stand up comedy competition and a mate of, me, uh, mate of mine sort of convinced me to get up and give it a go and, uh, and I won and the prize for winning was that I got to represent uh, the university at the National Universities Comedy Competition which was a couple of weeks later uh, which was pretty nerve wracking. I showed up and uh, up against me was a team from Victoria University uh, called Flight of the Concords. Yeah. And it was a tie <laughs> between Canterbury and Victoria that year. <laughs> Waikato came in eighth. But nonetheless, that competition has been a very big springboard. Uh, Flight of the Concords, as you know, uh, I mean, they went uh, to Edinburgh. They won the number one award in comedy, the Perrier Award. Then they went to the States. They got two series on HBO, won an Emmy Award. One of them won a Grammy. The other one won an Oscar. And me... Well, I'm spending my Wednesday night back at the university hosting the Winter Lecture Series, so <laughs> it's nice to be here. I am, um, in all seriousness, um, stand-up comedy has been a bit of a gateway into just about everything I've done since then, and it's been, you know, 20 years uh, since I first did that gig, uh, 19 years. Um, my best gig and my worst gig were both here in Hamilton in those early years. Um, best one was uh, at... Um, <laughs> The, a place called the Outback Inn, I think it's still around. It was during orientation week and they decided to have a bit of a talent showcase. They had a thousand students and the showcase was running a bit late so the dance floor had already started. And at 11 o'clock at night they turned the music off and they said, okay, stop dancing everyone, there's a guy called Jesse who wants to do some comedy. <laughs> and 
they actually booed me on my way up on the stage and I managed to turn them around and had a really good gig. So I sort of remember that as one of the toughest, uh, you know, one of the, one of the most rewarding gigs I've done. Um, I didn't stay triumphant for long. <laughs> About three days later, they had the pyjama party at the Outback Inn, which I was the uh, host of, and someone leant over as I was emceeing and pulled my pants down, my pyjama pants, like a full down trowel. Um, and I had a script in one hand and a microphone with the other, so it took some time to get the pyjama pants back up again. It was really mortifyingly embarrassing, because I was a student at the time, you know, I was thinking people around university are going to, you know, have seen everything. And, Embarrassment, I'd like to say, disappears with time, but uh, it was about three weeks ago, I was at a black tie event in Auckland, and a woman came up to me looking quite glamorous, and she said, um, Jesse Mulligan, um, I just want to let you know that I was at the Outback Inn that night <laughs> that someone pulled your pants down. There are a lot of us out there, and we will never, ever forget. So yeah, so Stand Up uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for me from you know, my first job at a local radio station here in Hamilton right through to um, Seven Sharp, which I uh, started last year. You know, tonight's lecture is what does the future of viewing look like? And you know, to be honest, it was um, meant to look like Seven Sharp. Seven Sharp was invented, they got rid of close up and they decided you know, if, we're, if we wanna stop hemorrhaging viewers, we're gonna have to create this new um, amazing half hour hybrid of news and entertainment that'll come on at seven o'clock and we'll get the young people excited. And, um, and you know, that first week, you, I mean, that show, that what we were, we were trying to make that show, you know, and it, and it didn't work for whatever reason. And, um, and the show sort of solidified a wee bit um, during the year. And then this year, it's sort of the audience has really stabilized. And I've got great presenters, but they've really sort of tried to decrease some of that risk. So they're, they're really almost making the same sort of show as close up you know, under a, a new look, and that's going for them, but, you know, it's not quite the same sort of answer to the question that they were asking back in the start of 2013, you know, when we all came on board. Um, so if the future of viewing doesn't look like Seven Sharp, um, what does it look like? Well, don't ask me, I'm unemployed, but luckily we have three amazing speakers tonight to talk to you about it. Uh, Associate Professor Jeff Leland, he's Senior Lecturer in the Screen and Media Department here at University of Waikato. Uh, next to him, author Julie Thomas, and finally from uh, The Wireless, she's a senior producer there, Megan Whelan. Uh, and then we'll do a bit of a Q&A after that, so if anyone's got any questions, uh, hold on to them, and we'll sort of run a little bit of a question and answer session uh, towards the end of the lecture. So let me tell you about some of these people. Um, Associate Professor Jeff Leland lectures in the University of Waikato's Screen and Media Studies program, where he focuses teaching and research on television studies and audience research, on world cinema, film distribution and exhibition, issues of media and cultural identity, journalism training and children's use of media. His writing is featured in a large number of publications, including the International Journal, uh, Journal of Cultural Studies and New Zealand Memories. He's been a judge for the Qantas TV Awards, the New Zealand Screenwriters Guild Awards, and Tropfest NZ, and is frequently called on for media commentary. He's the New Zealand editor of the Directory of World Cinema, Australia and New Zealand, and maintains the Cinemas of New Zealand website. And he's currently researching Shirley Temple double competitions in New Zealand in the 1930s, a really interesting project which includes interviewing some of the participants who are now really a remarkable women who are in their 80s. Next to him, Julie Thomas started her writing career at the age of eight, writing stories about pre-revolutionary Russian princesses. She's now written three novels and seven feature film scripts. And she published her novel, The Keeper of Secrets, as an e-book for purchase online. And then HarperCollins US got in touch and said, we want to publish it. Her career spanned 25 years as a writer and researcher in TV, film and radio, and she semi-retired to Cambridge from Auckland three years ago to focus on her writing. It's obviously paid off. She's currently hard at work on her next novel, Rachel's Secret, which is a follow-up to The Keeper of Secrets, uh, and it's due out in November 2015. Her next one, Blood, Wine and Chocolate, will be available April 2015. And Megan Whelan is the senior producer for The Wireless, and that's a website, really interesting website if you haven't visited. It produces inspiring, insightful, and entertaining stories for people who have grown up in the digital age. And she's worked in Radio New Zealand News, Sport, uh, and Radio New Zealand International, and covered everything from elections to earthquakes. Elections are her specialty. Recently she's written about voting and voter turnout in New Zealand amidst the upcoming general election. And she mixes up with writing features on a range of topics from vampires to mental health. She also holds a master's degree in political silence. So please give uh, all these speakers a lot of love as they come up and speak to you and put your hands together and help warm up this room on a cold winter's night. Please welcome, first of all, Associate Professor Jeff Leland.
Uh, Kira, good evening. Um, the uh, future entertainment in 15 minutes, I, it's going to be a very um, short talk. I could probably talk, do a short talk about the future of the National Party <laughs> in five minutes. Um, but uh, I'm going to address some of the issues here tonight. Thank you. So it's a message of hope and despair, and that's pretty much my state of mind these days, particularly when I'm uh, marking student assignments. Um, <laughs> But I do see a lot of hope, and I do see things that continue to worry me in the entertainment industry. Thank you. So um, this, is probably, this probably encapsulates in many ways um, my attitude to the current entertainment industry, an industry that is still largely dominated by uh, American cultural products, AKA Hollywood. Um, and um, I'm particularly interested in, and also often worried by the con that continued domination, particularly uh, the domination of New Zealand by cultural products from America. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. This is my first book I ever wrote. Um, uh, and it's interesting that one of those images still persists of Madonna, the other one you might recognize. But I have always kind of engaged with these kind of ideas. Um, so. Hating and loving Hollywood. This is the hating bit. This is Michael Bloody Bay. You all know who Michael Bay is? The, um, the person responsible for the Transformers films and other atrocities. Uh, to me, he exemplifies all which is wrong about contemporary entertainment media. Next slide. Thanks. Um, and I'm not the only one that thinks like this. Um, this is uh, from uh, one of New Zealand's best screenwriters, James Griffin. Um, he also holds them to account, or argues he ought to be held to account for what he does. So that's a hating bit. The loving bit is um, these kind of films, both mainstream films, art house films. Um, and I'm, I'm not, you know, some might think I'm a bit snobby, but when I encounter a mainstream film that comes out of Hollywood, as we know it, um, and delight in it, it's kind of reassuring for me. The Lego movie, I thought, how the hell could you make a film out of bits of plastic? I went to the Lego movie, and it's a really, really enthralling film, a funny film, a film I really loved. And there is also, in addition to film, I'm talking primarily about film, but as Hollywood continues to milk the formulaic, the cliched, the disposable, prequels, sequels, remakes, franchises, um, Television, is, television, I think, is taking the place of the kind of stories that I want to see. I read the other day um, a story that really made my heart sink, that uh, over the next four years, American studios are uh, have proposing that they'll be releasing 22 superhero feature films. 22. That's more than five a year. I'm already superhero, encountering superhero fatigue. You know, the thought of the next four years of more of those kind of films just fills me with horror, absolute horror. Um, so I looked, looked to television, this kind of television, and it's a particular kind of television. It's not, I'm not talking about New Zealand television. That's uh, for another day, another discussion. I'm talking about the kind of television, long form, complex television that is coming out of all places, America, and most particularly HBO. Breaking Bad, Sopranos, Fargo, True Detective. That's the kind of satisfying stories that I'm finding these days, and I quite blatantly direct my students towards um, in terms of the things they ought to be watching. So I'm not the only one that worries about these things or kind of declares their prejudice about these things. Um, British writer Mark Commode um, to, uh, also writes about the future of film. And uh, he writes about and other things I'm interested about, how film gets made, how film gets exhibited, and how film gets distributed. Because there is now obviously a great sea change taking place in terms of distribution. It's a digital world, so actually even using the word film may be no longer really valid. Films are not shot on film anymore, they're shot digitally and distributed through digital means and screened through something called DCP, or Digital Cinema Packages. Um, and now we have the return of 3D, but I think 3D has been a really fairly abject failure. Has anyone seen a really good 3D film in the last couple of years? Yeah, maybe Richard has, yeah. Um, 
but they're rare. 3D has not really been utilised as it could have been. It's just, again, just tagged onto horrible franchise films. Okay, and also I'm interested in terms of who gets to make films in terms of um, the personnel. Um, and this was in The Guardian just recently, and it's still very much a boy's game. Despite the fact that research, when you look at research, who are the majority of film goers are female. Uh, over more than 50 to 60% of people who go to the cinema these days are female. And it suggests that um, they're not really getting the films that they require or they need or they even want. Um, that it's still pretty much still a male-dominated audience in terms of um, who makes films, who distributes films, and who screens films. Despite the, and the, the kind of the, this kind of myth still persists that films are only viewed by boys aged 15 to 24. But no, that's not the, actually the case. That the, t the cinema audience is shifting dramatically towards a real a female perspective. And these are the kind of films that women go to in the greatest numbers, so-called art house films, um, or quality cinema. And indeed, even in New Zealand, it's the strongest growing sector of the cinema audience. Cineplexes are in a sort of either in a kind of stable or in slight in decline in terms of the audience. The, the audiences that are growing strongest in New Zealand are the, is the art house cinema audience. And along with that, what's been given me a, a kind of a, a hope this year is there seems to be a renaissance in local film as well. Just in the last month, I've seen three to four great New Zealand films. In particular, The Dark Horse. If you haven't been to The Dark Horse, you've got to go to see The Dark Horse. Uh, what We Do in the Shadows, Fantail, and there's other films coming along. Housebound is the next one. So suddenly there's these films which are telling local stories and telling them damn well. The thing, these are the films that all New Zealanders should see. I try and get my students along to them, but you know, it's uphill battle. So one of my contribution to all this is uh, I've had this website going for a couple of years. It's really about um, the places where these films can, get, can be seen. There's more than 100 cinemas, independent art house cinemas in New Zealand, scattered all around the place. I set up this website to um, celebrate them. Some have closed over the last two years, but surprisingly new ones have opened. Everybody's an open naki, raised funds locally, reopened their cinema. A new cinema has just opened in Cambridge, a town that hasn't had a cinema for over 30 years. There's a community also um, open cinema in Dargaville, the Anzac Cinema. So to me, these are signs of hope that there is still an audience for film and its audience, that the audiences are looking for a particular kind of film. And locally, we have the Lido. That's my local. Um, you all should know the Lido. Um, it has... Uh, a kind of the atmosphere of a bordello in the nicest possible way. Um, you know, chandeliers and plush carpet and um, real red velvet curtains, and it's a place where you get to see the films that, that need to be seen. And that is tonight where the International, coincidentally, the International Film Festival is opening there tonight. More, and also locally, we have the Regent in Te Awamutu, which, if you've ever been to, is kind of like a living museum of film history. Um, it's just wonderful in terms of the uh, proprietor has actually gathered together all this kind of detritus from closed cinemas incorporated in the cinema. It's a wonderful place. It's kind of a magic place to go to. And the cinemas generally are a magic place to go to. And even down the road, down uh, State Highway 1, Tai Happy the Little Majestic, which is still going, and it's a community-run cinema, and it shows recent releases. One of the problems, though, obviously, these cinemas are, are facing, in, in a number of cases, is upgrades to digital. You don't get film on film anymore. You don't get film cans. You get your films through flash drives or little um, digital devices. Um, so you have to have the screening facilities to enable you to, to use that. So that is a problem, but most of them, uh, to my, I just got an um, email just a couple of days ago from Waira, and the Waira District Council is looking to reopen the um, Gaiety Theatre. It's been closed for several years, and they're actually putting money into it, digital projection. So to me, 
the cinema has always been the kind of centre of a community, and it's it's kind of really really heartening to see the centre of communities come back. Okay, and just this last slide, this is one of my um, favourites. This is Ruby's um, in Wanaka. Wanaka has two art house cinemas, Cinema Paradiso and Ruby's, and it's an experience to go there. It's a magic place. It's like going to some sort of 1930s bar. And that is the delight that going to the cinema for this kind of audience seeking this kind of film is more than just going to a film. It's about experience. It's about the cinema experience, but it's also about the experience of the building and the atmosphere. So, just to finish, how am I just about finished? Took as long as you like, I'm enjoying it. Oh, no, well, I'm just about done. Uh, so, does, does entertainment media um, have a future? I think television has a future, a kind of rocky one, um, an uneven one, a patchy one. Um, to me, Television has a future if it continues, if HBO continues to pour out that great drama that it produces. And then if New Zealand makes more examples of, um, of docudrama like the Louise Nicholas film on Sunday night, if it, it, if it could go back and, and show some faith in drama series like Harry, which is one of the best detective crime fiction series ever made in New Zealand, I think television has a... Uh, um, a future, but as I say, um, it has many, many pressures upon it. Does film have a future? I think so. I think it really depends on our willingness to continue that really curious practice of gathering in a darkened space with a bunch of strangers at a set appointed time and watch something called a film, a larger than life experience, just one more time. So I say to my students, you watch films on laptops, that's not film, that's a form of film. Film always and must be something larger in life, you go to the bloody cinema to watch films. So that's where I end, thank you. Yeah, I like the sound of that, a return to the boutique, getting out of that home theatre system and going back into the dark uh, with a community of people. I enjoyed you mentioning True Detective, by the way. Anyone in the um, audience seen True Detective? Hands up, yeah. Uh, it's a couple of you. Uh, we, had, I, we watched the finale about a week ago and I haven't slept since. It is truly, it starts off as quite a, quite a well, it is slow, I think, you know, and it's a slow builder, but by the end it's like a horrible, horrible nightmare. <laughs> but it's good. All right. Uh, please put your hands together and welcome our next speaker, uh, author, novelist, Julie Thomas. I'm a bit shorter, am I? Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And again, thank you all for coming out on a winter's night. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can refer to my notes if I need to, which means I don't see you very well, but never mind, it's age. Um, in May 2011, I sold up in Auckland and I moved to Cambridge. Um, I'd spent over 25 years in the media. I started in radio, then I went to video, to television, and lastly to film. Um, and I decided that I needed work life balance. I'd written, um, as Jesse said in the introduction, I've written since I was eight. I used to write the first chapter of novels all the time. Um, I used to say to my mother, if I don't write, I'll burst. Um, and then so I decided if I didn't do it now, I would never do it. So I was going to sort of semi-retire and I was going to give myself 12 months to see if I could succeed as a self-published author. I had three works already on my computer, which was why I knew that I'd know relatively short, in short time whether it would succeed. I had an 85,000 word novel, I had a book of six rather quirky short stories, and I had my dad's letters that he'd written home during the war. First of all, the novel, um, I called it The Secret Keeper, and it was written between 1998 and 2006. It took an enormous amount of research because it's based on fact, and I triple checked every single fact because you only need one person to say, actually, that's wrong and your credibility is, is blown, and I was working full-time as I was writing it. It's basically the story of a 1742 Delgisu violin, uh, which was looted from a German Jewish family in Berlin in 1939, and it, the book goes from pre-war Berlin through Dachau to Soviet Russia to present-day USA, and it's, it's kind of a sting, 
staged by the the descendants of the family to get the um, violin back because it gets looted by the Nazis and then it gets looted again by uh, the Red Army, the Soviet Army. Um, it's based on fact and it was a very emotional experience to write it and I got to a point where I really wanted the story to get out and be told. The other major thing that I had to put up was my dad's war letters. Um, my dad was a Spitfire pilot in World War II he was a reservist too, he was called up in 1939 and he served in 485 which was the New Zealand Spitfire Squadron and then after about a year he went out to the Middle East and he served in 23 Squadron in what was Persia, it's southern Iran. He was at the fall of Tobruk and he delivered Spitfires to Russia for Churchill and he had a really interesting war and when he died I inherited letters that went from 1930 when he was a schoolboy and his parents went to South Africa, went to Africa, big game, literally big game hunting, and or my grandfather did, and right through to 1959. And so I took the war letters that he had sent home, plus the letters that my grandparents and his um, younger sister, my aunt, had written back to him. It was a real social history of both England and the Middle East and also Auckland from 1939 to 1944 when he came home. And he was an extraordinary writer. He really was amazing. And he'd written since about night flying and spitfires and enemy action over northern France and things. So I edited them into a 40,000 word book and I put that up as well. So on September the 9th, 2011, I took a deep breath and I, I uploaded the novel, the war letters and the short stories to Amazon and Smashwords. Both of those sites you should describe as digital bookshelves. You can put your books up there, doesn't cost you anything to put them up, you charge people to buy them, but the sites themselves don't really help you to sell them. Um, and then in February 2012, I added a fourth book. It was a novella, it was 40,000 words, and it was going to be the first of three. It was called In Vino Veritas, and it was a genre that's quite popular on Amazon. It's called Wine Crime. It's, it's black, it's funny, um, and it's full of people murdered using wine bottles of Petrus and drowning in vats of wine and things like that. Um, so let me tell you what my experience was like. For the first couple of months I think I sold about 14 copies of the novel and I remember the first time I saw a sale I thought, wow, somebody's bought my work. They've paid 99 cents. <laughs> um, and then one morning in November um, 2011 I woke up and I'd, found I'd sold 1,500 copies overnight. So I thought, whoa, what's happened here? And what had changed was that it had got some five-star reviews. And you learn as you go, and believe me, it's a steep learning curve, that Amazon works on an algorithm. When you upload your book, you're allowed to put two genres and some tags, which are just words that people will use within the internal search engine of Amazon to find books. And so one of the genres that I'd chosen was Jewish fiction, because it is basically a Jewish fiction book. Um, and what happened was that people had given it five-star reviews, it had got on the bestseller list for Jewish fiction, and so people could find it. You know, when they wanted Jewish fiction, they went to the list, and there was my book, along with sort of 25 others. And as it got reviews, it rose higher through that list. Quite quickly, I was number one on that list, and I was the only Gentile author on the list. Um, and so it starts to sell. It's a snowball thing. Something like that has to happen first. Um, Smashwords is a basically just a digital distribution. You, you s sort of format your book and you email it through to them and they send it out to iTunes, Nook, um, Sony, Diesel, all sorts of other sites. And as a non-USA resident, I wasn't actually allowed to put anything up on Barnes & Noble except through Smashwords. And Barnes & Noble are very good. I sold 9,000 copies of the novel through Barnes & Noble's Barnes & Noble in January 2012. So, you know, it's worth doing. So, my self-publishing experience was successful on two levels. First of all, I sold lots of books. I sold 50,000 copies of the novel. I sold 48,000 copies of the wine crime novella. I sold 42,000 copies of Dad's book and 35,000 copies of the short story. God knows who bought them, but 35,000 people did. On another level, I gained a traditional publisher. I'm one of those stories that you hear about. People say it do doesn't happen. Um, well, it does. Because in May 2012, I got an email from HarperCollins USA that actually went into my spam 
inbox and it had your ebook. And what I'd done on the back of all the ebooks, the last sort of page, um, is part of the promotion stuff that you do. You say, thank you for getting to the end of my book. Um, this is an email address you can send to. You put book alert in the subject line and I will email you when I have new work out. But this didn't say. When I started getting book alert, I thought, what on earth is this? I opened it up and they said, really enjoyed your book. Please tell me when you've got more. And so I've got a little sort of folder of them. Um, but this one said your ebook, and I thought, hmm. So I transferred it over and very gingerly opened it to find that it was a woman called Carolyn Moreno, who was the senior vice president of editing at HarperCollins USA, and she said, I'm quite interested in your writing if you'd like to email me back. So I thought about it for about a nanosecond, and then I emailed her back and said, hello, here I am. And she, eventually we spoke after a few emails, and she told me that a literary agent had come up to her at a book festival and said that she'd read the book on her Kindle, and it was the only book in 40 years that she had to reread again straight away because she couldn't bear to be parted from the characters. So Carolyn had read it, right place, right person, right time. I ended up with a contract. I signed the contract on in June 2012, the book was released in June 2013. It's now available in eight international markets and as an ebook. and the initial print run was 125,000. My second novel is called Blood, Wine and Chocolate and that's released through Harper's in April of next year. What I did was I took in Vino Veritas and I extended it out to 87,000 words, made it much blacker, much funnier and added death by chocolate. So not only do people die with wine, but they die with chocolate. I won't tell you any more because it spoils it. Um, and I'm now writing a sequel to The Keeper of Secrets, which again will be released through Harper's in November of next year, and that's called Rachel's Legacy. For a long time, we didn't think that there was a sequel to it, but then I was looking at the violin and at nothing else, and then I realised that there's a character in it who dies very young in the war, um, but she's, she's about 18 when she dies, but she's in the resistance in Berlin, such as it was. Um, she's in the Red Orchestra Network. And the research that I did to make the little passage about her um, full of fact was fascinating. What these, there was a, a Luftwaffe general in the Luftwaffe ministry in Berlin who was actually a Russian and American spy and sending plans and things out. And she works for him, and he was a real figure. So I thought, I've got, I do have another book, so it's Rachel's legacy. So was it successful? Yes, got me what I couldn't get in any other way, quite frankly, which was a contract with a traditional publisher. So what are the pros and cons of self-publishing? The pros are that you have complete control over your book, what it looks like, what it says, it's a direct reflection of you and you alone. And you get to keep the substantial amount of the revenue that it generates, all 99 cents. Well, not quite. You are your own master. When you look at the statistics, Amazon doesn't actually reveal their sales stats, but Morgan Stanley say that Amazon earned approximately $4.5 billion in 2013, which was up 26% on 2012 on Kindle readers alone. That's just the sale of Kindle ebook readers. And I do know that from November 2011 to February 2012, they were selling over a, min a million Kindles a week. And that's quite a long time ago. In the USA, ebook sales make up 30% of all book sales, and nearly 20% of all ebooks are sold through Amazon for Kindles. So what does that equate to? It equates to millions and millions of people who want something to read. Smashwords also give you exposure to, you know, Sony and Kobo and Nook and iTunes, and all their owners want material as well. The cons are that you're competing with over 6 million other books, and that the top 100 books on Amazon make up a third of all the sales. So you can see that the rest of them don't sell that much. Your chances of cut through are really small, but they are there, and your chances are considerably higher if your work is well-proofed and well edited, and it has a, a good dynamic cover, and it attracts attention. All things that are there to learn on the internet, but so many people just write it and stick it up there and expect it to sell. So if your self-published book is too highly priced, it won't sell. Nobody knows who you are. They don't know whether you can write or not. Um, so if you put your book up there at $5.99, they're going to go, I'm not going to risk $5.99. But if you put it up there at $0.99, cents, they think, well, I'll give it a go. Um, so you actually get less than 50 cents per purchase 
and then you pay tax on top of that. If you compare that to $2.50 from a traditional publisher for each copy of the book, and my novel is, is translated into Dutch, which was a huge thrill for me, um, and it sells in euros, and I get $4 a copy, and it's sold 10,000 copies so far, the Dutch book, and I would have to sell 120,000 copies of an e-book to make this amount of money that I've made just from the Dutch publisher. Now, the next con is that you do all the work, and I mean all the work. You edit it, you proof it, you design it, you get it ready to upload. There are professionals who do it for you, um, and some of them are very good, and there's masses of them on the internet, um, but they will seriously eat into any revenue that the book might make. And all the information on how to do that is there. You've just got to take the time to read it and learn it and practice it. And then when you've finished it and you've uploaded it and you're happy with it, then the really hard work starts. You have to visit forums and websites that you know you'll find the people that are interested in the genre of your book. Um, you blog, you Facebook, you tweet, you get your friends and your friends of your friends and your friends of your friends and then you eventually you wonder why nobody's talking to you because all you ever say to them is, by the way, do tell people about my book. Um, and you visit numerous sites. There are numerous sites set up you know, for people that will publish, help publicise um, self-published books. Would I do it again? Of course I would. It was an experiment and it worked for me. Am I glad that I now have a traditional publisher and I get an advance against my royalties and I have experts who do the editing and the proofing and the cover design and the marketing and the promotion and I rock up to the launch as a HarperCollins author? Am I pleased about that? You bet. So how does accessing books online change the experience for the reader? On a practical level, you take this little reading device with you and you can take hundreds of books with you. You know, it's small, it's light, you can alter the font size, you can actually alter the font. I think you've got a choice of six fonts if you want to. Choosing ebooks online is like being in the biggest bookstore in the world. You know, you, you open the book digitally, you can read a bit of it, you can choose to buy it. Once you buy it, it's there instantly, it's downloaded, you don't have you know, postage or taking it home from the shop or whatever. And it's like having more books than you would ever have in the biggest bookshop in the world. Is it better? That's a very subjective word. It's not better. It's not worse. It's different. It's a matter of personal taste. It's hard to flick back through an e-book, you know, like when you think, oh, what happened back there? You know, you've got to go through every page. And when you hold it in your hand, it feels like a piece of technology. Is reading a paperback a romantic notion from the past? I hope not, quite frankly. Nothing feels like a book except a book. Walking around with an e-reader on your head won't correct your deportment. And you can't have a bookshelf shelf full of beautiful e-books. I have strong childhood memories of my dad's um, shed in the garden. It was lined floor to ceiling with books. There were big ones and small ones and heavy ones and old ones, lots and lots of books about planes. He had a leather-bound set of books by Winston Churchill. They were bound in white leather and they were signed by Winston Churchill. And when I was about 10, he gave me a leather-bound set of Jane Austen. And I knew from that day what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. All my working life in the media I've written, and now I just do it all day long. I get up in the morning, I have breakfast, and then I cruise into the office and kick the cat off the computer, and I sit there and I write. And nothing beats the moment when you hold your own book in your hand. Absolutely nothing. Um, I can tell you a story. When the box of these was delivered, because I have an overseas publisher, I do everything with courier by courier. And um, when the final box was delivered, it was a little Indian courier driver in Cambridge that everybody knows, and he delivered the box. And when I realised what they were, I kissed him. And he dropped everything. He dropped the signing thing, the box, the, you know. And I just said, oh, I'm so sorry, I've waited 40 years for this. And he just looked at me and he said, are we late? <laughs> and I said, no, it's okay. It's, it's, you can't understand. It's my book. It's my book. And unfortunately, I was visiting my mum in a rest home. Um, my mum was there beside me all the way through this journey, and she died Christmas Day of last year, but she did go to the book launch for this, so she did see it happen. And I went to visit her in the rest home, and when I was um, on my way 
back I stopped into Countdown to do some shopping in Cambridge and they have these self bar scan things you know that you can pretend to be a checkout operator and I was putting my groceries through and I looked up and who was next to me but the courier driver and I went I'm terribly sorry and he just went ah grabbed the bags and took off out the door so I now have a different courier driver they haven't let him come back to me but that's what it means it's your book so I hope um, that's an insight into self-publishing and where it can lead Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Check your spam folders, everyone. Maybe that's what I've been doing wrong for the last six months. It's amazing. I love what a, pu a purist Julie is as well. She said, um, I didn't think that there was a sequel there, but then I looked in the book and I realised that there was. If that was me, I don't know about you, I'd be, I didn't think there was a sequel there, but then I looked at my bank balance and I realised... <laughs> There was. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our final speaker, Megan Whelan. So, uh, yes, I'm Megan Whelan from The Wireless. Um, I've been a Radio New Zealand uh, journalist for about 10 years now. And about two and a half years ago, uh, the then chief executive, Peter Kavanagh, sent around an email saying, we'd like to have a meeting of everyone who thinks, uh, who is interested in young people and what young people might like from the media. And we all sat down and uh, we sat around a table for a morning and we had these fantastic ideas of, of what we could do. Uh, and the idea of a youth radio network has been around for a very long time. Uh, and it's kind of gone out the window. Uh, the commercial networks would never let it happen, happen. The government would never let it happen. And realistically, we know that young people don't listen to the radio very much. So why start a radio station just for them? So we sat in this room and uh, we had all these fantastic ideas of podcasts and recording live bands and putting out CDs. And then after lunch, Peter came back and said, yeah, so you're going to have four staff. And we went, ah, cool. So uh, we're not going to be able to do any of those things. Great. Um, and so then about a year and a half ago, uh, four of us sat down and had much the same conversation that Jesse and his team had and said, cool, so how do we talk to these people that only talk on the internet and uh, live on Facebook and Twitter and that we don't really know them in real life, except that some of our team are them. And so what we came up with was this. So this is the wireless and uh, as Jesse said, we aim to produce uh, insightful, inspiring and entertaining and occasionally educational content. Uh, this is how the site looked on Friday, I think, by memory. Um, we aim for a mix of news and current affairs and personal stories from young people. And so why did Radio New Zealand want to do this? Well, we have uh, a charter obligation, a legisl legislative obligation to uh, provide information to everyone in the country, to everyone that we can, regardless of their age, their ethnicity, their gender, whatever they are. And for a lot of people, Radio New Zealand looks like this. There are still men who walk around in shorts like that, I will say that. Um, and this is, this is a transmitter just outside Wellington. It's still there. Uh, I think that photo's from about 1910, 1915. So it, radio hasn't changed a lot. Radio, as it is, looks the same. But we know that young people aren't listening to Radio New Zealand National and Radio New Zealand Concert. Um, we, have a very, we have a very loyal but small audience of young people. And so we thought, well, how do we put this online? Because, you know, Radio New Zealand isn't great at the internet either. This is old, to be fair. But um, it's not that old. Um, but when I was looking at this for this presentation, I looked at this website, and it's from about 2005. And the thing that caught my eye is down the bottom left there, Kim Hill at Scott Base photos. And I thought, I really want to see that. I want to know what that's about. Kim in Antarctica, that'd be amazing. Um, and so what this kind of showed me is that content is the most important of what we do. And telling stories, regardless of how we do it, is what's important. And so when we talk about the future of entertainment, it isn't so much where you're looking at it, because people are looking at it everywhere, um, on their phones, on their tablets, lying in bed at night because they can't sleep, so they're scrolling through Twitter on their phone. That's where they're finding us. And so when we were trying to figure out how to connect with this very scary sounding audience of the millennial generation, the digital age, how would we talk to them? And we thought, well, let's identify what we don't want to do. This is a comment from uh, Stuff Nation. 
uh, and it's on an article about voting and why young people don't vote. And this person is basically saying, well, you know, if voting was just like Facebook, of course they'd do it, because young people only do things because they want attention. And you might think, well, that's Staff Nation, you know, that's where people go to have horrible fights and don't really say anything of value. This was what was in the Herald last week when they wrote an editorial about uh, young people going on Kim.com's party party and how, you know, government's a bit dull and boring, although it hasn't been for the past week. Um, government's a bit dull and boring and of course young people aren't interested in it because all they care about is silly, entertaining things. The following day, they had uh, Bob Jones write in an article that young people only care about their cell phones and Facebook and no one reads newspapers anymore. And the reason that no one knows about wars in Nigeria is because no one reads the newspaper anymore, to which I'd like to point out that the only reason I know anything is happening in the world anymore is because usually of Twitter, uh, which I usually get on my cell phone. Uh, my colleague, Al Hunt, who is 23 and who is uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met, had this to say in response to Mr. Jones, that it is actually possible to be both interested in what is happening in the world and play the Kim Kardashian game on your cell phone, usually at the same time, in the same way that it was possible to be interested in both the Springbok tour and Lionel Richie or Olivia Newton-John. And I looked up those names on Wikipedia today to figure out who was in the charts in 1981. So what does the wireless do? We do uh, what we call issues-based journalism, and it's multimedia. Uh, so we do radio, we do uh, well audio, we do video, we do photos. We are funded through Radio New Zealand and we have some money from New Zealand on air, which means we get to pay contributors. We do things like this. This is a young man writing about his experience of mental health and how it affected his employment and how uh, being on the dole was really bad for his mental health and having a job was great for it if his employer was, was good at it. We've also been lucky enough to be able to uh, work with videographers. Everything that is coming from the top is too slow and is too disengaged. So I think, yeah, the community here is essential to getting by. Out of that has grown this sense of people realising there's a lot of value in helping others. I think the only reason I did stay was because of the earthquakes, because I think it's now a more exciting place to be. For me personally, the city is better now and more engaging now than it was before the earthquakes. So this was a video out of Christchurch looking at the value of a city. And one of the lovely things about it is that so much of the news we hear out of Christchurch, which is incredibly important, uh, is, you know, dire politics, awfulness. And this was a video of half a dozen young people talking about how they stayed in Christchurch and how Christchurch is new and exciting now for them. They, you know, before the earthquakes, they were planning to leave. And now there are things in Christchurch for them. And so a lot of what we want to do is tell young people stories because there are very few places in the country and in fact in the world that are doing that, that are telling the stories of young people. We also work with illustrators. This is a woman called Meredith Harris and this is her interpretation of our monthly theme this month which is impact and how you might look at impact. We also asked an illustrator to look at housing and the election issue of housing and I wrote about 1500 words about why you might care about housing this election and Hadley uh, did this beautiful illustration which I think makes most of my words pointless because it's a perfect illustration of that issue. We also do massive big features. Um, this is a two and a half thousand word feature about the state of mental health services in this country and at the same time I made a 25 minute radio documentary um, about this, the same thing. Uh, and so we do you know, serious proper journalism and then we get illustrators to make silly pictures of the authors. Uh, we also do really, really personal, really, really harrowing stories. This is a young woman writing about losing her friend to suicide. And I haven't picked on the scary, horrible issues, it's just we've had a lot of those in the last couple of weeks. Um, my job title, oh no, one more thing, we uh, take, try to take information and make it more accessible. So part of that informing thing. On the left hand side of this is how Parliament, the Parliament website describes how a law is made and we asked an illustrator, Meg Howie, to uh, draw it, make it more interesting, put that on a page uh, and this has been shared by 
so many people uh, and is a really nice illustration of how a law is made in this country, which if you went to the Parliament re website and read it, it's confusing and dull. Uh, my job title is Senior Content Producer, and I hate the word content. The internet is full of content. And I would argue that maybe what we should do is talk about stories, because it's the stories that matter. It's not the content. And realistically, it's not the medium. It's fitting the medium to the right story. So sometimes stories come in pictures. And if you've been watching the news for the past week, you'll know that uh, who this man is and what he has to say. Sometimes it comes in the form of radio. Hopefully, if I can make it play. The Prime Minister John Key is dismissing claims made in a new book by investigative writer Nikki Hager. The book Dirty Politics alleges Mr Key and his office are involved in passing embarrassing and potentially damaging information on their opponents to National Party-aligned blogs. John Key has rejected that there are any inappropriate links between his staff and right-wing bloggers Cameron Slater and David Farrer. What we've seen is a typical Nikki Hager book. I mean, quite frankly, uh, full of baseless allegations and theories which don't stack up. Story has moved on a little bit in four days. Um, so, you know, if I'm on the bus or I'm doing the dishes, that's how I want to get my information. That's how I like to hear these things. Sometimes I want to be able to read it. Sometimes I want to be able to sit down and sometimes I want to be able to read it in a book and sometimes I want to be able to read it on the screen. Um, and I want lots of words and I want to look at how, you know, I want to be able to interpret what those say. Sometimes I want to see yet more video. We went down to Wellington to ask people, this was uh, late last week, we went down to the waterfront in Wellington to ask people if they had heard of Mr Hager's book and if they thought it would influence their vote. If all the information can be backed up, I think it's a good thing to kind of get the information out there because there's a lot of dirty politics in every country. So it's, I think people should make the effort to find out the people that's doing the bad things and get rid of it. As I say, I don't really know too much about it, but it would be hardly be surprising. I mean, I think you'd be a bit naive to think that these, these sort of things don't happen. Yeah, I've got no clue in political bullshit, really. <laughs> I reckon it's all bullshit. We tried to convince him it wasn't, but that's fine. Um, and so the story can be told in a number of ways. You can also tell it through the art form or medium of uh, emoji. This is, again, my colleague Al uh, telling the story of Dirty Politics, the book itself, through, if you have an iPhone or a, um, an Android phone, you can get emoji on your phone. Uh, so in the end of 2011, the Labour Party was happy? Oh no, the Labour Party and the Green Party, that's what the little leaves are, were happy, but it was them against the National Party, who were the little blue circle, and they were happy. John Key is the little man with the tie. Uh, he likes beer and barbecues and golf and rugby, and everything is cool. Uh, so people voted for him, etc., etc., etc. Different stories being told in different ways, but it's the same story, and it's a way of getting different people into the story. We talk a lot about social media, and uh, obviously Twitter and Facebook are um, uh, ways that we get people to get our information. And Radio New Zealand is, itself is very slowly starting to um, figure out how to do this. Uh, and part of that is part of growing this audience and becoming more involved in the digital space. On Monday morning, Guy Onespina did what was an incredibly good interview with the Prime Minister. Um, uh, asking the word, saying, is it okay, over and over again. Uh, that interview, this tweet itself was retweeted about 160 times when I last looked, has been favourited a bunch of times. It set the news agenda for the day and actually, in, in fact, for a couple of days. Uh, it made the Prime Minister, uh, put the Prime Minister under quite a lot of pressure. And from our point of view, from Radio New Zealand's point of view, it changed what was happening in the news that day. It gave me a bunch of different kinds of content to be able to do that day. And this is what was happening behind the scenes. This is sessions on the website in Google Analytics from uh, the day before Sunday, which is a quiet day, uh, to you can see nine o'clock in the morning uh, when that interview was uploaded, well, about half past eight when that interview was uploaded. Uh, it was listened to 
in about 24 hours about 30,000 times um, and obviously shared incredibly widely. So it actually doesn't matter what the medium is. Some people got there through Twitter, some people got there through Facebook, some people got there because stuff in the Herald re, um, reprinted the, the interview. Uh, some people listened to it on the radio. A lot of people listened to it on the radio live and a whole bunch of people got it off the website. So, yeah, what is the changing face of entertainment? I think for us, for the wireless, it's telling the stories of young people in interesting ways and informative ways and hopefully slightly insightful ways and in ways that people are likely to engage with. And we spend a fair bit of time figuring out which one is, is the right way. But the joy of it is that when we get it wrong, we can do it again the next day because it's the internet and everything changes almost immediately. And that's us, yay. Thank you, Megan. Um, well, three very smart people with very different perspectives on what media is doing now and where it's going. Um, I'd be delighted to open uh, up to the floor for questions. If anyone's got a question they want to ask uh, any of our three speakers or indeed myself, um, I think we've got a microphone on its way. Oh, there's a microphone over here. Uh, hand up if you uh, want to ask anything of uh, one of our uh, panellists. So, yeah, uh, so one right there and then one, up, one in the front row as well. Hello. I have a question for Megan. Um, I've noticed on the wireless that a lot of stories from journalists have quite a personal aspect to it, and I wonder how you felt sort of bearing your soul online for a story. Um, is it the song? Yes. It's, uh, it's incredibly confronting for me as a journalist. As kind of an old school radio journalist, I'm not the story. In fact, I want to stay as far away from the story as I possibly can. What we know through a bunch of research that we have done ourselves and uh, have been done overseas is that young people don't, and I hate using the term young people, but there really isn't another way to say it, young people don't connect with media in the same way that my parents' generation does. Radio New Zealand isn't as recognised a brand for my colleagues as it is for my parents. Uh, and they recognise people because we all have personal relationships on the internet. You know people from the internet. There's a couple of people in the audience that I know from the internet, and that is the only way I know them. Mm. Um, well, no, I know them in real life now, but yeah, I met them on the internet. <laughs> um, and so what we know is they, do, they, they connect with storytellers because they feel like they know them. So when I, so I wrote, a, along with that big feature about mental health, I also wrote a story of my own battle with depression uh, and uh, talked a little bit about that and there were two reasons for doing it one was that it felt incredibly disingenuous actually to to make half my friends talk to me about their mental health and put it on the radio and not do the same thing myself uh, but also it was another way to get people connect to the bigger issue and so what we do is we ask, we get people to tell their personal stories and most of the time they're really willing to do that in fact probably about two-thirds of the pictures we get from our contributors are personal stories. I want to write about the time I did this. Um, and I was terrified about putting that article up because I had no idea what the reaction was going to be. And it was incredibly positive. It was amazing. Um, and But the amazing thing about it is that you can see... Uh, when we published the article, it was uh, three days after the Insight documentary went to air and two days after the main big feature was published and almost every person who read my story either listened to the Insight or read the feature. And that's ultimately why we did it, because my story actually made people look at the issue. Uh, and, yeah, it was terrifying, but it was totally worth it. It's Megan, we've got one up the front row here. <coughs> Um, my question's for Jeff, uh, and it's relating to the uh, current International Film Festival. Uh, the version that we're getting in Hamilton seems to be a very pared down version from what's in Auckland, and I'm just wondering who's making those decisions. Is it someone in Auckland saying we don't need to see it, or is it the Lido saying it won't fly? Um, it's probably a number of factors. Quite a number of the films that were um, 
and on, on in Auckland they're getting a general release, like Boyhood, for example, and 20,000 um, Hours of My Life, the one about Nick Cave. So that's one reason. Um, smaller cinemas here, Alito, um, two, three screens. Um, but the interesting thing is, and Bill Gosden says it himself, who's director of the festival, that Hamilton is one of the best performing centres for the International Film Festival. In fact, it does as well in some ways as Auckland and Wellington do, given its population base. So, yeah, it does, when you see, look at the, get the Auckland program, then you get this kind of slim version, and Hamilton is a, it is a wee bit disappointing, but there are some damn good films in it, nevertheless. And the good news, you'll be getting all 22 superhero movies, so that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, two at the back, thank you. Hello. Yeah, hi there. My question's for Julie. Um, for starters, welcome to Cambridge, Julie. It's <laughs> much better to live there than Hamilton. <laughs> and with uh, um, so much crossover with writing genres now, how, mu how important do you find it is to have a, a distinct voice in your writing? Is it something that is going to set you apart? or does it not really matter that much? Um, it's an interesting question, because when I did Secrets, um, it's a particular type of book. It's a historical, although it has some contemporary fiction in it, it's basically an historical story. And um, I had a contract, I had a clause in my original contract for the next book, and very quickly HarperCollins said to me, so, what historical fiction are you going to write next? And I thought, oh. Really? And I said to them, actually, I want to, I've got this idea about writing a book um, and I want to do, I want to create a detective and she's a retired racehorse trainer and it's a cross between Dick Francis and Agatha Christie. And they just went, no. Mm -hmm. They said, everybody who reads your book will expect a, a certain kind of book. Um, it's taken me a while to persuade them that that is really not me. I've always written widely, um, everything from board reports to poetry you know, in my writing life, and I don't want to be stuck in a genre. So against their advice, I wrote Blood, Wine and Chocolate and said, don't judge it until you read it. And, and my New Zealand editor now is uh, Finlay MacDonald in Auckland, and he came back to me and said, I pissed myself laughing, it was so funny. And I said, do you want it? And he said, oh, yes. So, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. As a writer, you have to think commercially. You honestly have to think. They're investing a huge amount of money, and they need to know that the book is going to sell. Um, if you've sold a few thousand copies, it gives you a bit of leverage. And, and I thought, will I use it or won't I use it? Because the first time it was yes, sir, no, sir, anything you say. This time I thought for my own artistic integrity, I have to stand up and say, I'm going to explore other things. When I finished Rachel's Legacy, that whole section will be over and I can give life to my equine detective. And get back to board reports. No. No, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Another question at the back. Hello. Uh, questions for Jeff. My sister lives in the United States and she speaks of Netflix and they get streamed movies on a monthly account. Now I look at that, they don't have many DVD stores from what I can gather and I'm wondering in New Zealand will that same sort of thing happen here where most movie content comes through the internet not through the DVD store that we know so well and we go down and get it out and return it late. Yeah, well, there is talk about Netflix coming next year, possibly, to New Zealand. We have got some services like Lightbox, but you look at what Lightbox is offering, it's stuff that's already been screened, it's largely repeat stuff. Um, whether Netflix regards New Zealand as a big enough, big enough kind of population base, I don't know. But again, it's still delivering films to devices where I don't think films are um, ideally seen. So... Um, Long live the bloody cinema, really, I'm saying. You can see films wherever you want to, but we need to maintain those cinemas as well. I just want to add what um, um, was said there about uh, income from books. Uh, I do think it's absolute bullshit that some people are saying about um, Nikki Hager making money out of that book. Because you know, any author published in New Zealand, you don't make a lot of money. And that's not his reason for publishing that book.
Uh, any more questions? We've got time for one or two more. Hello. Yeah, we'll take you in the, um, in the back row. Um, I have a question about um, the books. Um, do you find people um, have a better interest in stories that are first person or third person? That's an interesting question. Do you even think about it or do you just start writing? Um, actually, I do think about it because I very nearly wrote Rachel's Legacy in the first person. Um, I find first person harder to write simply because if you're in third person and you're doing a, a, what they sort of call a, a God-eye narration, then you can see what everybody's thinking and what everybody's feeling. Whereas a true first person narration is only that person's thoughts and emotions. Um, they're, they're both perfectly legitimate ways. It's, it's just how the story tells itself. Um, and I plan it out, and I have an overall arc, and I know where I want the characters to go. And then you just start, and if it doesn't work, well, then you'll try it another way. And for Rachel's Legacy, I have tried it, because it's basically a diary written by a dead person, um, I have tried it several different ways. So it's, it's purely personal choice. I suspect the majority of books are written in third person because it's easier to do. When Thank I was your age, I used to read books called Twister Plot, which were written in the second person, if you can believe it. Uh, room for one more, if we've got one more. Yes, hello, let's come up to the second row here, please. The lady in the middle, I'm sorry. Julie. Julie, I read your book, and um, when Rachel, what happened to Rachel at the start? Well, I spoiler alert. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, and I went, I'm sure I know what's going to happen. She's going to live happily ever after. And she didn't. Sorry. Mm. I actually didn't give that away. Um, and so I'm really pleased that you've written the sequel to give her some, not life, but... Yeah, because so, it was so tragic. Yeah, to give it a voice. Those characters, uh, I did years and years and years of research, and those characters are um, emblems of the things that I found. I found, I read hundreds of survivor stories, I watched hundreds of footage. I watched 200 hours of violin music. Um, and I watched Band of Brothers Liberation for the Auschwitz. You know, I, I watched all sorts of stuff. And as I found a generalised thing, like I found fathers who would not believe that, 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 I mean, this guy in the book, Benjamin, is a banker, and he just does not believe that, that the Nazis will do this to him because he, he has government contracts. And all of a sudden they turn up at his bank and kick him out, you know. And, and there is a certain level of blindness and naivety. I found characters that tried to run away, all sorts of things, and, and incorporated them. And the resistance in Berlin is a fascinating story, and it's a story that very few people know about. It's the same with the Soviet women pilots. That's another aspect that I'd like to bring out, because they were incredibly brave. Mm. You know, they, they flew without parachutes, and, and they wore men's boots with newspapers stuffed in them and they basically flew, you know, fighter planes in combat for the Soviet Union and people don't know that. So and I think also you know the women that actually went behind lines into occupied France, those stories Yes. The 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 there's there's hundreds of untold stories. I can keep going till I'm ninety. Hmm. Um but we're due to finish at seven. So um, we will we'll stick around if you want to come up and say hello to us. Uh, if you know someone who might have enjoyed this lecture, it's going to be on iTunes U, so you can look it up and uh, listen to it again for your pleasure. Uh, um, now, I'll, I'll ask you to put your hands together for all of our speakers one more time, please. <laughs> and I'd welcome uh, Acting Vice-Chancellor Professor Jones back onto the stage. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for hosting uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, to Jeff, uh, Julie and, and Megan for sharing your thoughts, insights and experiences. Um, I think it's been a, a riveting evening. To our guests in the audience, thank you for attending as we were reminded three times tonight on a cold winter's night. And I'd like to do, uh, also remind you of uh, next week's lecture, the last lecture in our series called The City of the Future, What Hamilton Can Learn From Others. 
Um, I've received some interesting emails about that. Um, but come along and hear from experts in city planning, uh, property development, demography, about as they examine how Hamilton can learn from other cities who've gone through successful revitalisation processes. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. I encourage you to continue mingling in the foyer, um, talk to the panellists and uh, pick up information about next week's final lecture and you're welcome to stay and purchase drinks from the Opus Bar and continue the conversation. So thank you very much. The University of Waikato, where the world is going.